This is WFO Radio. Hey, everybody. We are back. That's right. Two a days. We're doing two a days. Had Alan Reinhardt a little bit earlier. We recapped the whole race. But now we're going to get into it with our pro stock winner. Just seconds from now, Dallas Glenn, for the very first time. You're going to love it. I am going to hit him with all kinds of questions. Dallas, be ready, bud. He's down there in the ready room. But before we do that, I, the people who make it possible for me to do this, right? Like literally, I could not sit in the studio all day chasing drag racers around without the help of the folks at Frank Hawley's Drag Racing School. They got a great program called the Dragster Adventure, where you can drive a dragster. They come around the country. You and your friends, you and your sales team, you and your buddies can even set up a race. Maybe you want to become a race winning driver. Who knows? FrankHawley.com. Also, SamTech.edu, the School of Automotive Machinists and Technology. Blockhead CNC programs, Motorsport EFI, the next generation of crew members. And we know what can happen once you become a crew member, right? We'll find out that soon enough. Go to SamTech.edu. Total Seal Piston Rings, the leader in ring seal technology. What does it mean? If you want to find that hidden horsepower, totalseal.com 4 p.m eastern time thursday we're going to do a hidden horsepower live on their facebook page so like it right now totalseal.com and of course my buddy marvin rodak rodax coffee and grills.com hot sauces and spice rubs and coffee just like this sumatra organic honey which is incredible and i'm all coffeeed up as you can probably tell you could probably tell. Call Marvin, 817-924-6821. Plus, check out the WFO Radio Store where you can get hats and shirts and all kinds of good stuff. And our great friends at Nitro Fish have got the 10th anniversary T-shirts. Yes, we got people out there already weighing in, saying what's up and checking it out. We ask you to share the show, especially if you love Pro Stock. And let's bring them on. A first-time winner in the Camping World Drag Racing Series, Mr. Dallas Glenn. DG, what's up? How's it going, Joe? I'm glad to be here. Good. Like, you know, there's Daryl Gwynn, who is like the legendary DG, and you are the newest DG on the scene. A first-time winner, Dallas. Fourth race in. That's insane. Congratulations. How does it feel? Oh, it uh, it feels incredible. Um, I mean, obviously, I was, you know, we're, we're, we're super competitive, so, I, you know, I wanted to go out and win the first one like Josh Hart did, which was incredible for, you know, it was congrats to him, but... Uh, we were just, uh, I felt like I've been driving good the whole time. I've, uh, you know, I a real sharp learning curve. I, you know, you make a little mistake here or there and you just try to correct it. But um, it just kind of took a little bit to to get the car kind of worked out, which I, I told a lot of the sponsors and everything. I was like, you know, these the pro stock cars, they're, they're super finicky. You, can, you can't just swap a driver and expect everything to just, you know, slide right in and gel. So it uh, just took a little bit to kind of get everything worked out and once once we we got we know we have the car in kind of a happy place we seem to you know missing it's really just missing that extra qualifying run being only to do three or even two in atlanta it it, uh, it really affects you know how much and how easy you can you can get the car worked out so uh, once we got the car worked out for sunday though i mean it just made just three of the most like smoothest beautiful passes that, that a driver can hope for I amazing mean, it, stuff uh, Amazing. So let's let's do this because I want to talk about the round by round. And I know that your time as a as a crewman over there at KB Racing, which you shared the story of how you got the gig in the media center. I would like to share that with my audience because, you know, Dallas, I think that we we all love pro stock. You're devoting your life to working in pro stock and we got to keep it going. Right. We've got to share the reasons why people are so passionate about it. And you as a young man kicking around the pit area trying to get a gig, wanting to be involved. Like, I love that story. And I think people want to root for someone like that. Uh, you know, Greg, of course, has got his fans. I don't know how many brand new Greg Anderson fans are created each race. The new people, you know, they, a dad brings his kid to the track. Dad's rooting for Greg. Well, the kid might not root for Greg, but he might root for you. So how did you get to the point where you were even trying to get a gig in pro stock? Like, where'd you come up? Did you start out racing? Did your dad race? Where did you race? And when did you first fall in love with drag race? Um, I think I first fell in love with drag racing when my dad was, was racing. Um, really, it was kind of like the family the station wagon, which was a top bulb over here, super pro for NHRA. Um, so originally, my, my grandpa built it. And he was uh, took it out for the first time in 15 years. 
and I think it was in 2000. And his, uh, I think uh, one of his first passes back after redoing the car, he was still working through some issues. He actually had a heart attack and passed away in the car at the top end. So it was kind of like, a, you know, it's a, it's a special car in our family. You know, I th think it'll ever leave the family. So my dad got it all fixed up after that a few years later. And he went out and raced. And then he went out and won the track championship at, in Pacific Raceways in, in Washington in 2005. And then he had an absolute bullseye on him in 2006. And by the end of 2006, he was done. And I was turning 16. And I just absolutely, I mean, I was his crew guy. I was there every every race, dialing the car, working on it, doing whatever it needed. And then uh, basically, when as soon as I turned 16, three days later, I was making runs in the car and just kind of kind of everything clicked. You know, my, my older brother and my younger brother were always better, you know, circle track racing. And I always kind of like working on stuff more, but when I got into drag racing, that's, it just really clicked. And, um, I think it, it shows how much, uh, so much I, I love for it. Cause I mean, I, I can't, I can't stop. I'll get it. You know, I, I kind of call myself, uh, a uh, little bit of a car whore, you know, I'll drive anything, you know, anything, <laughs> <laughs> anything in drag racing. I mean, I'll, I'll drive anything at least once. Um, I don't know about a front front engine dragster. I, I kind of, I may, I don't know. Those, those guys, they, they, they got bigger ones than I have because yeah. I don't know well, about the engine in front of me like that. Depends if it's Craig Bourgeois comp car, I'm yeah. sure you do that. But uh, one of these like nostalgia nitro dragsters, uh, maybe not, you know, it's a, uh, it's a tough yeah. one. It, it takes some serious convincing. I mean, I won't say that I absolutely won't, but it definitely takes some serious convincing. Dallas, I didn't know that story about your grandfather, and it speaks so much to mm -hmm. your passion that this is deeper than like, hey, I like cars or, uh, you know, racing is competitive. This is like in the fabric of your life and your DNA and your dad. Mm -hmm. and it just means it means so much, uh, I can imagine. And uh Wow. I just, uh, I can't imagine what was that was, was like, uh, but to get back in the car and have your dad go out and win and then have you get in there at 16 and that's to think about where you got now. It, it makes sense. Like the drive now mm -hmm. it makes, it makes sense. It's clear. Yeah. I mean, and it was, it was in that car that I was racing that, uh, um, you know, just driving good and learning, learning all the, the stuff about bracket racing that I first met Shane Thompson with silver state. And it was like just my the end of the first year I was racing at Yakima Speedway and he was there because that's his hometown. And I think I, I took him out in one of the rounds and he's like, you know, this 16 year old kid just took me out and he came up and talked to us and he's like, hey, why don't you come down and race my top sportsman car in February? And that kind of started that whole relationship with with Shane. And I mean, Shane, Shane's a great guy. He's, he's put me in uh, pretty much every car he's, he's owned. I've, I've gotten a, a chance to work on a race and. And I can't thank him enough. And it's actually in his cars that I, that I uh, raced against Dan Provost with Rad Torque and first met him. So it's like everything just kind of all falls together over the years. And, and I, I just, I'm really thankful of all the people that have, that have come across through, through the, the journey um, up through the ranks. And, and you're just getting started, but now you're on a different stage, a different level. Uh, let's tell the audience about how you got the job at KB because to me, it's awesome. It's a great story because dreams do come true. And if you're aggressive and if you take a shot and ask a question and are in the right place at the right time, good things can happen. No promises, everybody. You're not all going to drive pro stock cars, okay? But you might get a job that you love. Dallas, how did how did that happen? Well, it um, with some of the racing that I was doing, um, I had first met Kelly Wade. Uh, she was with National Dragster at the time. She did a couple stories. And her then boyfriend, now husband, worked on KB Racing as Greg's clutch guy. And she had known just through stories and, and covering stuff like that that I had always just wanted to be a pro stock. I absolutely love pro stock, everything about it. Um, I was working at an uh, engine machine shop, building engines, um, just you know, normal bracket engines and street engines. And I just loved everything about pro stock. And it just so happened in 2012, the end of the 2012, actually in Pomona, the, the finals, um, I was talking with Kelly a little bit in the staging lanes and, and Pat was Greg's uh, cl clutch guy. And he just was like, Hey, you know, we got three guys coming off the road and Kelly tells me you want to work on a team. And, you know, we are looking for a young guy to kind of jump in and, and learn, 
you know, if we can get a young guy who doesn't have any experience, we can kind of teach him how we like to do things and, and try to keep him here for a long time. And just kind of one thing led to another. It went from that. And then uh, at the end of the race, I met with Rob Downing, the crew chief, and, and talked with him some. And I had known Jim Greenleaf from uh, with, with Summit from uh, the Summit Super Series when I won the race to champions in, uh, let's see, what was that, 2009. And uh, Jim was there. He talked with Rob. I talked with Rob. Uh, Jason had known me from, from racing stock, and we just kind of all got together and talked. And then after that, I sent a couple, I sent my resume to, to Rob. And then over the Thanksgiving race, with uh, Thanksgiving weekend, where I was racing with Shane Thompson in Vegas at the uh, Thanksgiving race, I Rob called me, told me uh, he wanted me there in January to uh, be Jason's back half guy and a tire guy. And then it kind of just went from there. Wow. I love the fact that you're a bracket racer as someone who grew up bracket racing. I actually didn't grow up bracket racing, like got into it when I was a teenager, always wanted to, but you know, not everybody gets a race. You got to have a little extra money, got to have a lot of extra time. You got to be willing to work and, and you get out there, but anybody that claws their way up from bracket race ranks to the highest levels, uh, that is just an amazing story. I think it is great. All right, real quick, before we talk round by round, mm -hmm. uh, as you were a kid, the kid you were describing, who was your favorite pro stock racer? Like when you went to a race to watch at Pacific Raceways or otherwise, like who did you root for? Who did you wait for an autograph for? Like who were your heroes mm. as you were coming up? Um, to be honest, I don't really know if I had a one specific favorite. I mean, I just kind of, I just, I would, I just loved anybody who would talk to me. Really, <laughs> You well, know, I was uh, basically is um, I, I knew some, you know, I, I had met Warren a few times because of uh, a fellow racer, bracket racer in the area who worked for Warren Johnson, Adam Drzajic. He kind of like really opened my eyes to how absolutely amazing Pro Stock is. So I had met Warren a few times and obviously I knew knew of Jason and talked with him from, from Stock Eliminator stuff. And, you know, Jason always keeps in touch with all of his stalker friends. And and it's just pretty much just anybody who would talk to me. Um, I made friends with some of the crew guys on Alan Johnson's team. You know, I was just kind of everywhere. Um, but yeah, as, as far as any favorite, I didn't really have any favorites. It was, I just love being fan up there no matter what. Fan of the class. No, yeah. I, I get it. Fan, fan of the class. That is great. We got people checking in from around the world. Blake in Ohio saying, what's up? JT Motorsports. Yo, Dallas, your friends in the PNW are so happy for you. Is that Pacific Northwest? Yes. That yeah. is Pacific Northwest. Look at me. Look at me. Dave Lay is out there checking it out. Uh, Blake, congratulations on winning on Sunday. The four wide hope to see you in Norwalk. Phil is out there. Uh, who cares about PS? Let's hear about the family wagon in Seattle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, we got to that already. But I, I don't have a picture of the family wagon unless – which car is this? That is my El Camino, actually. That is – as that's another interesting story. So my dad actually just – he had a, a fab shop in Pacific, uh, just uh, maybe 20 minutes from Pacific Raceways. And he passed that car like every day for two years with a for sale sign on it. And, you know, the price just kept coming down and down and down. And it got to the point where he's like, you know, I, I just need to go buy that thing. And basically he bought it for my grandma and um, me and him, you know, it had like a blown up engine in it. So we took it, took the engine out kind of just rebuilt it was just a, just a regular old street car kind of just did a little kind of restoration cleanup on it you know put a carpet kit and cleaned up the wiring and put an msd in it and you know um just kind of made it nice and run and she drove it around town a few times and, and just loved it but didn't really take it out and then uh it was the second year i was going to race the all all state high school drag races at in you know pacific raceways and they told me that I couldn't race the family station wagon because I was too competitive in it. And they didn't want me letting go off the top bowl for a high school race. And I was like, well, it's okay. You know, I understand. That's yeah. fine. So I was like, well, I'll just hop in that thing. You know, it's a foot brake car. It's, you know, it, it was running 14s in the time in the quarter. Um, and then I, you know, the, the, took it out the weekend before to get used to it because I'd never foot brake before. And I, Run it up the first day and won the second day, and that was my first Wally I ever won. Bang. And I was like, Talent. well, now I'm like number one in points. I guess I got to finish off the season. And that was actually the season that I, uh, I think I finished 
third or fourth in points and made it to the race of champions, ended up winning the race of champions in Boise, Idaho. And that's how I met all the summit guys. So it's just, Wow. That, <laughs> see, like exactly like that is a story, like the mm -hmm. serendipity of racing. Like if you're, if your dad doesn't buy the El Camino, you don't mm -hmm. get to run. You didn't have a car available to run because you're a top bulb guy in the high school. The wins the, you'll go on to win a track championship. You go on to win the race of champions. The summit guys are like, Hey, this guy's good. And Greenleaf get helps, helps you mm -hmm. get through the door at KB racing for which you are now driving. Wow. Yes. It's, it's incredible when you really think about how everything is all tied together. Yeah, that, that is, that is great. So now like the opportunity to drive, did you know it was coming down the pike? Like Jason has been alluding to the fact that he was going to hang it up for a while, but was that just Jason being Jason or was Jason telling the truth? Like you probably had some general knowledge but the idea that you were going to be the guy and, and we got some people asking like which car is it is it bo's old car is it jason's old car as far as like which car are you racing to me it doesn't matter that much other than you're racing but tell me about like you know they're thinking about maybe letting me drive the car moments like you had to be feeling that right like oh maybe this could happen how did that happen yeah um jason is always hinted to the fact that, you know, he's always hinted and, and, you know, said, you know, Oh, you know, well, one day, well, you know, one day you'll, you know, you'll get your shot, you know, one, one day you'll get your shot. And I was, you know, you never know if it's Jason being Jason or if he's really meaning it. You know, I always, I like to think he was always meaning it because you know how bad I wanted to drive. I didn't know if he was just messing with me or if he really wanted me to, but he, uh, no, no, it is. It's turned out he really wanted me to, um, so when it, when it came time that he was going to hang it up and he was doing his final season and then Bo decided he was going to be leaving as well, it definitely opened up um, several cars, you know, two cars available to be able to race. So as I just started asking around about, you know, you know, sponsorships, hey, how much do you, you know, do you want to do anything for, for Pro Stock? You know, I got a, they, they said if I can get some sponsorship, then I'm more than welcome to jump in. So. Yeah, and I just can't thank uh, Dan Provost and, and Shane Thompson for for making that first jump, you know, that leap of faith, and putting their trust in me. And so, what was the quickest thing you had run before this pro stock car? Um, uh, Shane Thompson actually has a top dragster that I went uh, six seventy nine at one ninety eight in in Vegas. So I had been in the sixes already. I hadn't gotten the two hundred mark yet, but. Uh, you know, as far as being in a dragster, the dragster I felt like was was easier to drive, easier to handle. But he had a uh, mid seven second door car that I raced on some uh, questionably prepped racetracks that <laughs> were more of a more of a handful. And I think I had more fun in the door car. I think that was a better um, learning experience. Well, and they all lead you to this. All right, so let's. Uh... Uh, advance because you know we saw you down there at the world door slammer nationals and uh you know they coached you up you couldn't be learning from better people and uh you know i'd love to ask you a million questions we don't want to keep you all day but now you're in the middle of it right you're mm -hmm. you're in the in the stuff in a season where we got all these rookies and you know young guns and everybody is talking about the the next chapter of pro stock racing and you got troy coughlin jr you got mason mcgay hey obviously the quadras this whole pack of young guys coming in i'm sure there's you know, desire to be the first to do this or the first to do that and the breakthrough so what an amazing final round let's talk about how you got there starting out with uh the first quad where let me tell you it was as tough as it could get you got aaron stanfield who's you know he's not an old guy by any means he's just got a couple of races advantage on you in terms of he started what last year mm -hmm. Fernando Quadra, matt hartford and you, Hartford was off the starting line first, but didn't put a good rundown. And you guys were able to advance with a low of the quad, 650-35, 210. Tell me a little bit about that run. And you really alluded to the fact that these cars are hard to drive. Tell us about that because people, for whatever reason, think that they're easy to drive because they don't have fire coming out of the sides. No, they. Uh, these things are, it, it's amazing what just the little things that are greatly affect um, how, how nice of a run these things make. I mean, to, even to the RPM that you're, you're going into stage at makes a huge difference on, you know, it's just, it's, I mean, that run, like, you know, I, I can go back to every run and I always think of one little thing I can nitpick that I need to do better. And, 
it was actually in, especially in Vegas and Atlanta, I felt like I wasn't doing a very good job staging. I was, I was, you know, trying to go too fast. It was a little bit jerky. I would, maybe I rolled, you know, Atlanta, I rolled in just a little bit and got away with it with the double O two. Um, but it, so, you know, when I was going into this weekend, uh, you know, I was like, you know, I need to slow down my staging. You know, it's, you know, it not only does it, you know, when you jerk the car around, it gets, you know, it could get the tune up all upset and everything. And, you know, the RPM might jump around and you want to, you know, go in at a consistent RPM every time. And I remember I was thinking, I was like, okay, so just, you know, as soon as you know, I told, I told my dad who's, uh, doing the back half on my car and standing in front. I said, as soon as Dave Connolly is done doing the wheelie bars, you just go ahead and send me in the pre-stage. And then once one or two other guys are in, I'm just going to just take my time. I'm going to go in nice and shallow and I'm going to try to kill the tree. Cause I know that Matt's going to try to kill the tree. He's good. I know Aaron has been absolutely killing the tree and you know, you can't count Fernando out. You know, he'll definitely, if he will, the second you count anybody out, they're going to jump out there and throw a double O two on you or something and get you. So and I just started inching in and, and, you know, when I got in and I was just focused on staring at the light and I had a count in my head in case anybody got timed out. And I remember leaving, I felt good on the tree and, you know, I even, I just, you know, I hit my first shift good, but I, then I hit the chip in second gear and I was all panicked. So I shorted third a little bit and then, you know, you hit fourth and fifth fine. And then you're going through the lights and I'm still resisting the urge to look over because Jason told me I'm not allowed to do that. <laughs> Rocket racer. That's really yeah, hard it's, to do. That's really hard to do, you know. And so I resist the urge, and I just focused on trying to hit the shoots, uh, shoots at the right time, and getting the engine shut off. And and I see the the flashing light, and I just it's all it's all a relief once you see that flashing light, and you know the shoots are out, and you just go and you know you relax for a few seconds, so you get out of the car, and and then go go see what you can do to improve and try again on the next one. That's great foreshadowing for what happened in the final. I can't wait to hear about that. We got some questions out there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Derek wants to know what's the hardest thing to master as a new pro stock driver before we talk about the next squad. Um, I think one of the hardest things, which is even you, it's you have to learn from track to track, is the burnout actually. And you know, a lot of people have said, you know, I have nice burnouts. You know, I have a lot of experience in our burnout car. Our burnout car is a little bit different. You know, it's only a, it's a 572 crate engine and it only turns about 6,200 RPM. You know, pro stock car goes 10.5 and the gear, the gearing on it is a lot different, but you know, it's especially in Charlotte, there's a little hump right after you start the burnout and it'll want to throw you sideways and trying to hit your burnout right on your mark and try to not over rev the engine and hurt it or anything is, is actually incredibly difficult. And you'll see, you know, as usually the first thing you'll notice of any new driver is they, they tend to struggle with that the most. I think that's the hardest thing. You know, it's even in this weekend on the second qualifying run, I started to come out of the burnout and it almost was like I hit a puddle of water or something. I just wasn't used to, it seems like the track at Z max it's, there's not as much traction right outside the burnout box. So, I got the engine up too high and then it, it caused all kinds of issues after that. And then that's when I thought maybe I broke a spring or something in the valve train because the engine started trying to die on me. And it was just, it was all stemmed from whatever issue I had coming out of the burnout. So wow. it was just even that little thing screwing up in the burnout cost me a run. Right. Which obviously didn't matter because you won the race. But yeah. to me, like that's how you earn trust right with those guys like hey man the kid of course he wants to go down the track but he thinks something might be wrong in the engine and so he didn't go down the racetrack regardless of what it was like that that probably earned you some some trust with those guys let's go to the next as if you haven't earned it over the past 10 years but next next quad aaron stanfield aaron strong mason mcgahey you and mason are able to advance but uh, you know, Aaron Strong, what a weekend he had out there. Aaron Stanfield, obviously, he was a little late with a 55. You had the second quickest reaction time. And Mason McGay, hey, he's lights out on the tree. But he, the car mm -hmm. was on a 54-7 to go to the final round. And now you're going to the final round. What a feeling that must be. Yeah, I mean, that run, I actually, I think that run is the, the one that I remember the least of over the entire weekend. You know, it's obviously the the final round kind of just blurs everything before that a little bit because of all the excitement and especially confusion in the final round. But that uh, second round, I mean, the car is just absolutely, I mean, it was just making 
you know, as, as good of runs as, as I could have ever hoped for. I mean, it's just nice and smooth. It goes straight. It just, it makes it a lot, uh, I won't say easier, but it, it does make it a lot easier when the car is unhappy and it's shaking or anything like that. It just makes it a lot harder to make, you know, hit your shifts and everything. So when the car is working really good, it, it really helps you try to make better runs. And I remember, you know, as I remember going into, into that round, I felt like I staged really as absolutely shallow as I could. And I felt like I hit the tree as absolutely as best as I could. And I, you know, I came up 26 and hats off to Mason. He's been team pretty much every single hit that he made this weekend. And I know that Aaron is absolutely, um, Aaron Stanfield, sorry, there's two Aaron's Aaron Stanfield is absolutely, he's usually in the teens and he's got an extremely fast race car over there. So, you know, I just knew I just had to do everything I could and hit my shifts perfect to, to have a chance to go to the final. And, you know, when I, when I saw the light go off and at first I thought it was just a solid, which I'm still absolutely happy with about, you know, you know, after I got out of the car, I saw that, you know, I did get there first, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter for four wide, but you know, the car's just making absolutely killer runs and, and it's just, it, it, you can't, you can't think, you know, be any happier for it. I mean, it's just, it's killer. So now you're on to the final round before we talk about that. I just, I like, I'm thinking about, look what I got today. I got the, uh, you know, the Warren Johnson, Kelly Wade. Mm -hmm. So there's so many uh, like people you're mentioning, like, like Kelly and Warren and like all of the connections in pro stock. It's really a tight, amazing world. If you're, if you're into high performance, you get to work with and around Greg Anderson, Jason line, Dave Conley, Rob Downing. So, like, is it hard to determine? Do you listen to all of them? Do you have like one person that tells you what to do? Is it sometimes too much information? They're all on the same page because they work together, but I just can't like, do you ever talk because everything they're saying has got to be useful information? Yeah, no, it's pretty much, I mean, it's, it's great having that, uh, the amount of experience and knowledge and, you know, uh, success that, that those uh, individuals have had. And the amount of, of brain power that they have, I mean, the, what they know about engines and cars and how stuff behaves is just incredible. So it's, I mean, it's, it definitely stems a great environment to be successful because anytime I have an absolute, you know, any question about anything, I can just ask any one of them or, you know, whatever one I feel like is suited best to answer that question. You know, if it's, you know, a very in-depth question about an engine, you know, Jason might be the best one. Or if it's uh, in-depth, you know, something about suspension on the car, you can go to Rob or Dave. Um, something about driving, definitely Greg is is uh, usually the one I go to and ask. I mean, Jason as well, because he's extremely experienced and, you know, even Dave. So you can just, you can go to pretty much any of them. And, you know, anytime I have a question about anything, driving, suspension, clutch gearing engine just anything about the car anything about even racing in general you can just go ask any of them and you can always you know e even if it's something that you think that they've never heard of before you can just bounce ideas off of them and you know that's the the thing about such a high competitive class is you know every you know they're always willing to listen to any any perspective because you never know what somebody may stumble upon well, exactly. So the final round was interesting for a bunch of reasons. One, that you're all rookies. Troy, Fernando, Tro Troy was, you know, has had run some races. Fernando had run a couple of races. You and Mason, right? But at the very beginning of your learning curve, you're in the fourth race. But also, all four of the big engine builders. You got Elite, you got Frank mm -hmm. Iaconio, you got KB, and then you got Chris McGahey with the Southwest Performance. Like, wow, that is... A, a turning of the page, not that mm -hmm. everyone else is going away, but a showcase of the young talent. And this is where competitive Dallas has got to come out, right? Like I want to know about that Dallas. This is a race that somebody is going to put their stamp on pro stock and mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about running against Greg or Erica or any of that. You are just worried about beating the other rookies. So tell me about that, <laughs> that feeling, yeah. how you, how you dealt with wanting that so badly. Um, surprisingly in that round, um, even compared to some of my other rounds, like that round, I didn't feel like I was racing anybody else. I felt like it was like, I knew my car was absolutely killer and I had the absolute most amount of trust and faith in, in Dave and Greg and Jason and Rob to give me the best race car that they thought they could. And I felt like I had the best race car to beat. I know I can be good on the tree. And as long as I do everything that I need to do. I was basically just racing myself. 
And, you know, I was just going to go out there and hit the tree as good as I can, hit the shifts as best as I could. And as long as I did that, if I didn't come out on top, then the other person definitely earned it because I was going to make it as tough as I possibly could for them. And it, uh, as it turned out that, um, I didn't screw it up. That was <laughs> the biggest thing. You know, it was, uh, it was basically all I was trying to do was just not screw up because I felt like I had the car to beat. And, um, uh, going into the round, you know, before that with, with Greg, I felt like if, if Greg was in the final, I, I, I felt like I was going to be racing against Greg because his car is just absolutely, it's, it's yeah. so fast. It's <laughs> fast. It's I mean, it's, it's fast. Yeah. And it, it's just not only that, but it's, you can make a bad run in it and still go fast. It's so happy right now. It, it's just got a really large window in it. And, and I'm, you know, we're trying to get my car to the you know the point where his is, and it's definitely a lot closer. I feel like, you know, when, when your car is in a happy spot, you can make less changes and it's a lot easier to predict. So, you know, with the final round, it was pretty much just, you know, as long as I didn't screw anything up and I did my job, uh, it's just, all I had to do was hope that nobody else could do their job better, better than I could. And you were 30, you went 54, zero, uh, Mason kids. Good. 18 yeah. Troy, who's a lever 35 and Fernando left early. Um, but that's what, cause the confusion so you go down the racetrack yeah. you're not looking over we know about that but you were kind of robbed of your win light moment right like oh i won in the shutdown i always ask everybody about that because yeah that's like this peaceful racer moment where the win light is on you know you've won guys are on the radio you're hearing the gear sounds and you're just kind of realizing you won you were kind of robbed of that what was it like to be confused I'll tell you what, however confused you were, it couldn't possibly have been as confused as everybody on the starting line was because everybody was just like, who won, who won, what's the story? The number two, your lane was solid, which means mm -hmm. it couldn't have won because it's solid. It's supposed to be flashing. So one of the other ones is supposed to be flashing, except that's not what the case was. The case was Fernando went red, mm -hmm. and just threw off everything. You were actually the winner. So tell me how you sorted it all out. Um. I didn't really do any of the sorting, you know, like, you know, I go through the finish line and just hoping that I see that flashing light and I see it come on solid and an initial reaction is just, you know, uh, quite a bit of letdown, you know, it's like, Oh, you know, I, you know, I was so close. I had my chance and, you know, and then, you know, as you know, the shoots hit and you start slowing down and shutting everything off and you're like, well, you know, at least I came in second, you know, at least I got the runner up, you know, and I make the corner, and the officials at the top end are telling me to go to the left, which is, you know, the, the, to the right is where the winner goes. And then, you know, as you go left, it's that's where I guess the losers go. And I go far to the left because I was the first one to make the corner. And, you know, I start, you know, unbuttoning and take my helmet off, take my earplugs out, put them in the helmet. You know, I just kind of just kind of collecting, you know, resting after, you know, it's a it's a pretty long, stressful day, you know, of racing out there, especially because, you know, I'm doing the clutch on my own car. So it's a, there's absolutely no brakes. It's nonstop. And, you know, I collect and I just kind of collect my thoughts for a little bit, you know, get out of the car and I'm just walking up to the screen and I look over, I see Fernando, I mean, uh, Mason is over in the winter circle. And I was like, you know, I said he must have put down a lap because I felt like I was real good on the tree. And I just, you know, I'm real anxious to see the slip to see you know, what actually happened. And, you know, as I'm walking up, I'm looking for the slip and everybody's just looking confused and they're saying, no, well, who won? And, I'm, and I was like, why is everybody confused on who won? I mean, like it shouldn't be. And then I start looking at the, you know, everybody's pointing at the, the TV screen at the top end and I'm looking on the TV screen and that's right when they were showing the replay of my car, just having a nose over, over Mason. And my initial thought was, well, was there, a, you know, maybe a time, you know, like, maybe the beams were incorrect or something, you know, I know it's happened before where the sun hits just right and there's a reflection and, you know, the, the, those infrared lights can pick up all kinds of, you know, sunlight. I thought maybe something like that happened. And then I heard Reinhardt say it's, you know, official confirm that Dallas Glenn is the winner. And then I turn around, I'm kind of like a deer in headlights. Everybody starts swarming and taking pictures. And, and I was just like shock. I'm like, Holy, Holy cow. I won. <laughs> I was like, well, this, this is, uh, you know, you don't get that initial pump up of excitement, you know, when you're in the car. So as you know, you're not all pumped up and ready for it. 
Yeah, but it's great that it's special. It's different uh, and totally unique. We'll remember this race for a long time. Like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, remember that weird, bizarre first win that Dallas Glenn had? And you won the race and you got it done. And I just love the story. And uh, you get to go again real soon, too. Um, and, and now you are on the scene. And that that is great. What about after the fact I was able to swing by the pits? You guys look like you were having fun. You know, your dad, everything like. That's got to be a moment right there mm -hmm. to, be able to share that like, hey, you know, we did it. Uh, something you had sought after for so long. Yeah, I mean, uh, that was definitely a different perspective. Um, you know, I, you know, as, as they told me at the top end, I was working on Jason's car for 22 wins. So I'd never really, you know, you know, Jason goes, you know, he goes off and disappears for, you know, 30, 45 minutes and he comes back and then we take all of our pictures and, you know, there's all that extra stuff that, that I never, you know, I never knew exactly what he was doing. And now this time I got to experience the driver's side of it, you know, and, you know, to have Greg and, and Dave and Jason and all those guys who have all experienced that before, it was, it was real exciting because, you know, it's now I get to kind of experience it and, and see it and everybody's just, you know, in a great mood, you know, because, you know, with, with Greg, you know, we, we wanted, you know, obviously we want as many cars as we can in the final quad. So with, with Greg, you know, losing, you know, it was, it was kind of like up to me at that point. And to be able to bring it home for, for KB racing was, was real big. Um, and, you know, it's just, it was an absolute like celebration, you know, it was another, another thing that kind of made it a little bit different is we were actually testing one car the next day. So like normally we're tearing everything down. Well, this time we kind of get to leave, leave some stuff up. So it's like, we kind of get to relax, take our time a little bit more. It's not just like, okay, let's tear everything down and go to the next one. Now we get, you know, we leave the awnings up and, and leave stuff out. And it was kind of a little bit more, you know, everybody was there, especially being, you know, home hometown where I, where I've lived for the last eight years, you got lots of friends. You got everybody from the shop there, everybody, you know, it's just, it was just an absolute, uh, yeah. Uh, incredible experience. The home, or not home, home, but uh, current home race. Yes. That is a, a big deal. And uh, I don't know. I don't think it could have gone much better for you to get your first win and your fourth race in Charlotte at a four wide against the other three rookies and to do it uh, in such a dramatic way with some weirdness at the end. Uh, I, I think it is great. And, and you're back out you, an, another KB car this weekend, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I see, I see the entry list. And then what is that? Brogdon? Yes, it was Roger Brogdon. Roger Brogdon going to be back out there, who is like mm -hmm. a favorite person on earth for comp racers uh, mm -hmm. in, in Texas. Like they love this guy because he's put up that big bonus and he's going to run pro stock. We know he's good at, at mm -hmm. what he does. Just um, more and more happening in pro stock. Uh, one final question, just because uh, Blake is out there, wanted to know, and I think this is a good question. Uh, I like it. Besides wanting to win, which pro stock driver would you like to turn the wind light on against the most? You know, like that, like, man, I, I'm here. I've arrived when I, you already got to win. When you beat someone, who is that person? Um, being that I've already raced him twice, I'm going to say it's got to be Greg because he's taken me out twice already and I'm out for blood against him. You know, especially because, you know, he's got the car to beat right now and he's been driving very well. You know, he had the the little mishap second round, but, you know, he's driving really well. He's he's already he's definitely you know, he's the definite points leader right now. He's he's got the car to beat. So when I go up there and, and I go in and take out Greg, it's going to be just a little bit sweeter because it's going to be a little bit of revenge for the, the first two times he's gotten me. Absolutely. Well, and he's the goat right now. Like yeah. he's, the, he's the goat goat, right? Like we talked, uh, yeah. we had Heiner on and we had Dave on and I, I posed the question and they work with Greg, but a lot, a lot, you know, he tunes the car. He does, he works on the car. He drives the car. He does everything on the car. He's approaching a hundred victories. It's like amazing, mm -hmm. amazing stuff. Joe, let Dallas know we debuted his helmet on WFO live. Did oh, you know it's that? Ron, Ron settles there. He, uh, he painted my helmet. Um, I got in touch with him from, uh, Shane Thompson. Um, he paints a lot of Shane's cars. So, uh, Shane said, Hey, you know, I want to get your helmet painted. Uh, here's Dron's info, send it to him and I'll take care of it. And that was, that was real special. That was the first helmet I ever got painted in. And I absolutely love it. It looks amazing. And Jerron has been very kind to us, like sending us early release photographs of the helmets and whether you knew it or not, whether you gave permission or not, we debuted it on WFO radio a couple of weeks back, which is pretty amazing stuff. All right. Two more questions. Then we'll let you go just because people want to know uh, when testing 
do you find eighth mile uh, on eighth mile tracks? Do you get enough information? Like in the first eighth mile of the track, if you're doing testing, is that enough information? I, I would imagine it is. Uh, it kind of depends on what you're trying to test, really. Um, you know, you definitely you, you can start off that. I mean, even when we're going to a quarter mile track, we usually start with just eighth mile races, eighth mile passes. Um, as far as starting line work, clutches, tire suspension, that all is, you know, you can, you know, in the first 330 feet, really pretty much what you're trying to do there. But there's, there's some times where you need to go to the quarter to, uh, to you know, see, especially if you're testing engine stuff and any kind of engine development stuff, you really need to see how stuff runs down the back. Um, and especially with tune up stuff. I mean, that was one of the reasons why we wanted to test the, the car that Roger Brogan's going to drive is, you know, it's a, the car hasn't been out in almost two years now. So you want to make sure everything works and the tune up's good because, you know, it looks like, you know, especially with weather that we might be having in Houston, we wanted to make sure that if, you know, if we go out there and, and we only get one qualifying run, Roger's got a, a car that he's going to be able to, you know, qualify and qualify well with, you know, we want all of our KB cars to, to be in the top half. That's the goal. Absolutely. And yeah, Houston, 21 pro stockers attempting to qualify, which is so great for the category. Some of them are Mustangs and everybody's got something to root for. And if you're not a fan of pro stock, pick one of these young guys, like it could be Dallas or it could be, uh, you know, for whatever reason you might have. Um, I know the great Northwest is going to be rooting for you. Anyone you want to thank? Obviously, you already said that you're going to have to start paying your PR girl, which nobody believes that at all. Um, but, uh, you know, like this is a big moment, Dallas. I'm so excited for you. Hopefully, you know, you could tell a lot of fans. A lot of people, you're doing it the right way. You worked your way into a job and now you're reaping the benefits and you get to live your dream. Like what's better than that? Yeah. Um, I can't imagine anything that's better than that. I mean, that's one thing is, is that, uh, I've kind of, uh, proven at least to myself is that, you know, if you start early enough and you really dedicate that you want to do something and you want to do it bad enough and, you really put your nose to the grindstone and focus on it and stick with it that any, you can do anything you want. It doesn't matter what it is. If you want to be an astronaut and you only focused on doing that, then you know, you could probably be an astronaut. Um, wow. it's, it's just an absolute thing. And you know, and I can't thank, you know, my wife for, for putting up with all the extra stress that I've, that I've given her with this. I know she probably didn't need another, another client, but, um, I'm sure she, she doesn't complain being able to do, you know, she would probably never forgive me if I had got somebody else to do it. Yeah, exactly. Like who else are you going to get, right? So yeah, I mean, who, who am I going to, yeah. He, she would uh, probably smother me with a pillow in my sleep if I did that. Probably. Um, and obviously my, my dad's working on my car and, and he's driving the other rig with me. You know, I'm still driving uh, Kyle Kretzky's rig to each race and my dad's in Greg's rig driving, you know, it's got my car in the back. So we drive to each race and you know my family has just been absolutely so supportive and everybody at kb racing ken and judy black are probably the nicest people i've ever met on the, on the planet and um and i really absolutely just cannot thank dan provost and everybody at rad torque they uh you know they're just an absolute they're just on cloud nine right now just you know, just seeing everything that that uh that we're doing and all the exposure and you know they're they've always been real dedicated into racing their bracket racers themselves and being stuck in Canada is like kind of slowly killing them because they want to come to all the races that we're at. And it's just it like it even even when we're having, you know, the first round loss in Gainesville, double one and, you know, the, the round in Atlanta, they're like, you know, just, you know, you hold your head up and you keep on going. He goes, we're, we're, we're with you 100 percent. We're going to support you the whole way. And he goes, you just keep on going racing and we'll take care of you. And just, I can't thank them enough. I mean, that is as far as a sponsor, you can't you can't dream of a sponsor better than that they are the absolute best people and and i absolutely uh i'm dying for them to get to come to a race well it'll happen and you know the thing about being a sponsor and rad's been on you know quite a few different cars they helped chris marshall a couple of years ago get to races that he wasn't going to go to they're obviously racer centric and everything there's something different about being on the you know in the camping world drag racing series like you're mm -hmm. a star now man there's going to be people who are pro stock fans they're going to be chasing you around and i love the fact that you're still driving the rig like that is a from the bottom up grassroots uh, made it big time story. And, uh, that's what people want these days. They, they want to know that, uh, you know, you're working hard and you guys are obviously mm -hmm. hard Dallas. I can't wait to see you out there in Houston. Good luck again. Thank you so much. Uh, the audience is uh, loving it. Jerron says talking about Shane, uh, with silver state and HVAC and everything. It's just, uh, it's really cool to see mm -hmm. real happy. Uh, you are always great. Like 
except for that one time at Maple Grove where you ran off on me, man. I got to oh. say, but that, but that's that's forgotten now. Yeah, no, it. Uh, I felt bad about that one. I think I apologized to you the next like week. I ten was times. What are you talking about? You went over and above. Uh, you were you guys were fired up. You were going to the final. But... Yeah, it was. It was fight with me. It was first race of the countdown. We we're going to the final with Jason. I mean, was, I wanted to get back and make sure everything I could do everything I could to make sure that car is absolutely perfect. Yeah, but now you can't escape. Now you're the driver. Nope. You got to do the stuff. Now I, I don't want to escape any. I mean, anymore. <laughs> I want to, uh, you know, you know, Silver State and Rad. I want to get an absolute most amount of exposure as everybody I can. It was actually, uh, it was, it was cool. I got uh, the guy who works on our truck for KB Racing. Whenever we have issues or services or anything on our trucks, uh, Gallagher, Gallagher Fleet Solutions came on board with me for that race. Um, you know, I can't thank him too. He came out to the track. That was his first ever time being at, at, at a drag race. So wow. I got to, got to bring a, a, a new, new fan in and, and, uh, I think he, I mean, he picked a great weekend to, to jump on the car. Yeah. You tell him it's not always like that. Okay. Hey, it's not always like that. Uh, yeah. once, twice that three times is incredible, but, uh, now you guys got a great experience and it was awesome and you get to do it all again this weekend, hopefully weather permitting out there at uh, Houston raceway park. Uh, again, Dallas, these first time winter views on WFO for me, the best thing I get to do, you know, learn a little bit more dig in and, uh, and I know there's many more coming for you and the guys that are around you, they're super like confident in your ability. And so I can't wait to see what you're capable of. Just have fun, be yourself, be a character, enjoy it. And um, the fans will come. It will be great. All right. Thank you. And thank you for having me on here, Joe. It's uh, always a pleasure to be on here. Absolutely. Dallas, thank you very much. See you later. See you in a few days. Congratulations. Okay. I'll see you. Later. There he goes. Dallas Glenn, first time pro stock winner, KB racing and uh, just a great story. And by the way, he's on for 45 minutes, right? But we are like, my goodness, did I overextend him right there? The dino room is backed up right now because of you guys, WFO and me. But to me, like, you know, you, what is it? People root for people, people root for people. And how can you not be pulling for a guy like that? Who is genuinely living the dream that so many have had. And he says flat out, chase it, chase your dream. So my goal of heart surgery is not over yet, which is uh, good. I am decided I'm looking for volunteers. All right. We're going to get on out of here. I want to shout out, put your comments in the comment section, final comments in the comment section uh, as we bounce on out of here. Uh, and tomorrow I want to tell everybody 11 a.m. Steve Johnson, 2 p.m. John Force. 11 a.m. Steve Johnson, 2 p.m. John Force. Samtech.edu, the School of Automotive Machinists and Technology. Check out their website. You're a young person. You're thinking, man, I've got a dream to be a machinist, to be a crew member, to work on cars, to work on planes, aerospace. Samtech can give you a great start. Also, Marvin Rodak and Rodak's Coffee and Grills.com. The hot sauces and the spice rubs. You don't have to. It's very easy to become, to become a fan of Rodak's. Just call them up, 817 924 6821. Pick some coffee, give them your preferences, get the habanero endorphin booster hot sauce, which is my favorite thing that he's got. And uh, get Road Act 817 924 6821. Total Seal Piston Rings, the leader in ring seal technology. Thursday, we have got a live hidden horsepower on Facebook. So go to their Facebook page, Total Seal Hidden Horsepower, all of that. And uh, like the page and be ready for a little live at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Going to be talking about electronic fuel injection and more. Uh, Totalseal.com. And of course, Frank Hawley's Drag Racing School, the dragster adventure where, you know, maybe you don't want to become the next Dallas Glenn. Maybe you just want to experience a rear engine dragster for the first time. They make it really easy and fun. You show up with the clothes on your back and you leave with an experience of a lifetime. Wow. I just came up with a tagline for the whole thing. Check out our WFO store. We got cool gear, including these brand new WFO radio logo hats with the logo on the side, which is what everybody is doing right now. You can check them out in the WFO radio store. Click, and I will send it out, and I will be the guy to package it up, and I'll probably throw in some WFO stickers and all that stuff in there, face coverings as well, WFORadio.com. Let's see what everybody has to say, and then we'll get on out of here. We'll just leave. We'll just get on out of here. Let's see. All right, Blake. What's up, Blake? Good question, Blake. That was good. I met Blake out there in Atlanta. Blake is in Ohio. And I told him in the early show with Alan Reinhardt, like, have a question. And he did. Good job. Like, Jeff, great real deal story. Very nice to see hard work and such success. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Great job. Well, the kid, it's nothing to do with me. It's everything to do with Dallas. Like, 
and the and the the pit area at the NHRA is loaded with stories like that. And that's why opportunity for the young, no offense to the old and middle age, but opportunity for the young and the new and the fresh stories. Look at Mason McGahey. Like Chris is a good old boy. I don't really know Mason's personality just yet, but I know the kid can leave the starting line and we'll get our opportunity with Mason McGahey too at some point, maybe this coming weekend. Who knows? Maybe we'll go on a string of young rookie racers. Great job, WFO. Joe Dallas seems like a really great guy. Great guy. Nice to see. He is. No, he is. He's always been like, I, I nailed him with that thing that he ran off. The thing that was cool was it was him and his dad versus each other at Maple Grove in the final round. Because I think that um, his dad was working on Fernando's car back when he was using KB power. If memory serves me right, I could be remembering everything wrong. And I just thought it was an interesting story that Dallas was going to get to race against his dad in the final round at Maple Grove. But he was like, I got to go. And I was like, all right. You go, because in four years, when you win your first race, I'm going to bring this up. And I did. It's just a joke. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. Uh, subscribe to WFO Radio. It is a podcast. It's audio only, but it's also on Facebook and on YouTube. Okay, here we go. I have one complaint for NHRA.TV. Lay it on us, Jerron. What's the complaint? Send it. Great show as always. Awesome interview. Oh, it's just so much love here. 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. Force. Like, what's force going to be like? The class introductions are way too long. Often you miss a lot of the first pairs, and they are sometimes staged by the time they finish the intro video. Oh, uh, yeah, Jerron. You know, that is definitely a perspicacious observation you have made. And I will send it up the ladder. Maybe they're even watching, right? You know, like, imagine poor Reinhardt in the broadcast booth going nuts, like, waiting. It's timing. Uh, Roy Hill is, is good. We've got a lot of words from Roy. He is moving in the right direction. Uh, but you should go to Roy Hill's page and don't get medical advice about people from me because it is really not my place to say. But people have told me that Roy is speaking Roy Hillian again. So that is good. Good for Roy. Probably my favorite interview ever. Dallas is a great success story from hard work, focus, et cetera. Maddie, what's up, Maddie? Maddie's got a YouTube channel. Maddie gave me some stickers and uh, you got to check out Maddie. Great show, Do Joe Dallas is the real deal. Dave Lay, like as if anybody knows more than Dave. And there you go. Thank you so much, everybody. That's it for the day. Two a days. If you didn't see the Alan Reinhardt show a little bit earlier, it's right in our feed on Facebook and on YouTube. And you can go to the podcast because not everybody should be watching a, a screen when they drive, when they're going over the road, all of that. Podcast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Write us a review. Give us a star. Five, really, not one. Five. And uh, we're going to be back tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern time. Mike from PA says, what's up to Dave Lay? <laughs> I'm all choked up. Dallas Glenn story. No, great stuff. And we've been talking to a lot of the KB racers because they are money right now. What if Kid Chaos gets a win? Right? Like, we're going to have a lot of new introduction interviews this year. Because I feel like Kid Chaos is a win waiting to happen. Obviously, Troy Coughlin and Mason McGahey are definitely going to happen. Aaron Stanfield, we did his win interview last year. To me, he's a veteran, except he's really got, you know, 10 races under his belt. So it's going to be great. Really appreciate all you folks out there and everybody who supports WFO. Thank you. Not everybody knows about this. We need you to share the page, share the show, tell some people that maybe you like it. And we really appreciate it. All right. Next up, it's going to be John Force and Steve Johnson tomorrow. Force at 2 o'clock. We will see you then right after Steve Johnson at 11. And uh, that's that. The archives are open. Go check them out. If you missed Reinhardt, it was good stuff. WFO, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks to Sadie for setting it all up. Dallas, Greg, for lending him his computer. And that's that. We'll see you next time right here on WFO Radio.